Hey everyone, this is Lynn Bartim, and you are listening to the Apex Hour on KSUU Thunder 91.1. In this show, you get more personal time with the guests who visit Southern Utah University from all over, learning more about their stories and opinions beyond their presentations on stage. We will also give you some new music to listen to and hope to turn you on to some new sounds and new genres. You can find us here every Thursday at 3 p.m. or on the web at seu.edu slash apex. But for now, welcome to this week's show here on Thunder 91.1. Hey, well, welcome in, everyone. This is Lynn Vartan, uh, curator of Apex Events. I am so happy to be here today. We are talking about teaching and learning. Um, you know, every week is a different topic for our event series here at Southern Utah University. And this week, we're focusing on the science and psychology and all things about teachers teaching and learning. My guest is Josh Eiler. Welcome into the studio, Josh. Thank you, Lynn. It's great to be here. Well, it has been so fun to talk to you. And you have this great book, which we're totally going to get into talking about. But the name of the book is How Humans Learn. Um, yes. But before we get into the nitty gritty about the book and all of your research, I'd love to just talk a little bit about uh, who you are and your current position. You're doing some really exciting stuff at the university that you're at. So sure. tell us a little bit about what you do. Absolutely. Well, I currently work at the University of Mississippi, where I direct teaching and learning initiatives and work on a university-wide critical thinking program. I'm also faculty in the Department of Writing and Rhetoric, so a little bit of everything, but uh, it continues work that I've done for the last 10 or so years at other universities with uh, with these same kinds of teaching and learning programs. Um, so I'm really enjoying it. We just moved uh, a couple of months ago, and Love my new colleagues, and it's a great place to address some of our biggest challenges that we have in teaching and learning with some great colleagues. That's so cool. And previously, you were at Rice, yes. I think, is that right? Yeah, mm-hmm. for, for a long time, and, and you did similar things there, I think. I did, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I directed the teaching center there, and we worked on, I just had the, an amazing group of folks who were working together to improve teaching on campus and, and the learning experience for students. Mm-hmm. And at the moment right now, you're working on a, a large initiative. And can Mm -hmm. you talk a little bit about the scope of that? Right, sure. Yes. Well, uh, this is um, because of the region that our university is in, we're required every 10 years to put together a major quality enhancement program for the university. And we have chosen critical thinking in the gen ed program. So our goal is to enhance the critical thinking skills that students develop in the first and second years of their time at college. And so uh, we, you know, we're addressing that in a number of ways. I work with cohorts of faculty to, um, to revise their courses, to build more opportunities in there for students to develop those skills, uh, change assignments, activities, things like that. I do a lot of workshops across the university, uh, Uh, to give uh, a kind of a range of perspectives on the research and strategies that you might use. And we're working with departments and, and, and programs all across the university. One of the things that came up at lunch was this discussion of what exactly is critical <laughs> thinking. And right. I found that to be a really interesting because, you know, I use those words all the time. Yeah, critical thinking skills, you you know, all the. But now I, because of our conversation, I'm thinking, wow, you know, I may have a different definition of that. Right. And was it true that one of the things you found was that everybody defines critical thinking a mm-hmm. little bit differently? And how did you solve that? Oh, certainly. I think, I think, um, if you polled people in higher education across the country, I think every you'd come up with as many different definitions of critical thinking as you would people you were right. asking. So, uh, and that's that's natural. We all come from different disciplines, different backgrounds. The traditions of our universities are different. So I understand why. But if as a university you want to make improvements in this area, you have to come up with a definition that works for you that you can use to develop programs and that you can measure progress on the goals that you set. So mm-hmm. um, we, uh, as, a, as a team, we were much more drawn to 
Uh, the research that suggests that critical thinking is a discipline-specific skill. Uh, there is other research that says it's a, that it could be generalizable regardless of context, but we think that in order to be a good critical thinker in biology, for example, you have to know information and, and theories in biology before you can build those skills. Yeah, so I love that. That's kind of the core philosophy of our program, and we're just working with faculty departments, programs across the university to see what uh, what the needs are and what is the best approach for a particular program or particular faculty member for doing that. And that's not to say that critical thinking can't occur across disciplines right. and that you don't take those skills with you. Right. But as a core kind of starting point, yes. it, you have to have some uh, established knowledge in the field. So. Right. And particularly because we are looking at the gen ed program, the first two years, right. there has to be a way for us to say, to show progress yeah. from the beginning of freshman year to the end of the sophomore year. If we were doing a four-year initiative, it would be easier to say, okay, during your four years at the university, we, ho we hope you develop these general critical thinking skills. Um, but in the first two years, really, if you want to show improvement, you have to look at the course level and, and the right. program level. Right. Did you find that, um, you know, one of the things that we're always talking about is communication across campus. Um, you know, you're at a new school now trying right. to gather information from everybody from all over the place. Um, did you find challenges in communicating across campus? Do you have any tips for those of us in academia who want to <laughs> increase our level of communication across campus? Well, I yes, I do. I think that one thing I learned very early on as I moved into working in this area is that it was really it was really important for me to learn the vocabulary, the methods, the uh, and the the habits of mind of people in a wide variety of disciplines. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. If we're going to have a conversation about Critical thinking is one, but there are others like what's interdisciplinary mean, right? right. <laughs> yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> so if we really want to do cross campus work, we have to have opportunities to bring people to the table to develop a common language and common tool set for mm -hmm. dealing with that. And so that's really what I've been trying to do. It's so working with folks from across disciplines. So what when you think of critical thinking in your courses, what are you trying to achieve? How does it map onto you know these uh, these goals that mm -hmm. we've set as a university? And and there then um, I've made you know, wanted to make very clear that in no way was this program suggesting that people hadn't been teaching critical right, thinking. Right, right, of course. But that what we were interested in is a very specific version of it uh, and, and ways to actually show that students were making progress on these six goals. Yeah. And so uh, individualized conversations were the way that we could do that and then come together as a group. Yeah, cool. So many questions for <laughs> you. But one of the sort of obvious ones is that your, your background, like you didn't wake up one day as a seventh grader <laughs> and say, oh my gosh, I'm going to study the science of teaching and learning. No, it's true. You have a very different background, right. uh, I think, in the classics. So I'd love to hear a little mm -hmm. bit more about you know, how you transitioned and right. what that transition was like and how it feels. Yeah, definitely. Uh, you're absolutely right. I've been in the humanities my whole career. My, my uh, PhD is in medieval studies. And so <laughs> my first job, uh, I was a, a tenure track faculty member in an English department at a school called Columbus State University in Georgia. Um, and, you know, taught, taught a full range of courses, uh, Beowulf, Chaucer, the whole, the whole works. That's awesome. Uh, and uh, what really shifted for me was that I was able to see uh, at that uh, that mid-sized university in a small Georgia town, the effect that great teaching had on individual students' lives. So it was the, 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 the power of education was on full display there. And that really, uh, really had an impact on me. And what I wanted to do was uh, to find a way that I could help make that possible for more students than just the ones that I saw every day in the classroom or even beyond my department's impact. I wanted to see if I could be a part of the conversation at a national level that, so that we could get traction on helping every student have the kind of experience that matters for their lives, not just within the context of an individual course or semester. Yeah. And have you ever looked back? I mean, are there those times where you just 
go like, wow, this is just such a big thing to tackle. I mean, <laughs> it seems, I mean, overwhelming perhaps. Well, uh, it, you had to take it a little bit at a time and focus on a piece of it, I think. Um, it was, uh, in some ways, it was a hard decision because I gave up tenure to move into this Oh, work. really? Oh. Um, and so that, it, I recognize that not everyone can do that mm-hmm. uh, for a variety of reasons. And it was it was hard. And so uh, there's some, you know, there there's lots that go into that. But uh, for the most part, moving, making that move allowed me to t- to work at a different level at the university that I wasn't able to uh, to work at before, mm. and that gives me the kind of perspective on I think uh, on the work of a university, but also teaching and learning in higher ed writ large that uh, helps me be able to say, okay, we're not going to change everything all at once, but just like in a, in one person's classroom, incremental changes over time matter quite a lot. Yeah. Absolutely. And as you've worked with teaching centers and, and developing these things, I mean, do you do you find that everybody is um, really excited about this kind of thing? Or do you find sometimes that people are like, don't tell me how to teach? I don't, <laughs> I don't, I don't want to change anything. I mean, is that right. what sort of is more often the the threat? And I'm not just at your institution, but maybe in your experience right. at large. Definitely. Um, the reactions are all across the board, but uh, and certainly I've seen resistance, uh, although not not very often. I think the common denominator, what I've seen most often uh, everywhere, is that uh, most people went into this profession to help students, right? And so, regardless of what reaction uh, I, I'm seeing about a particular program, once you actually engage in conversations about, well, what do you want your st- what do you want your students to achieve? What What is it that you want to be teaching them? That changes the dynamic. Right. And so I definitely understand the skepticism of, uh, a, a, of any kind of impulse where it seems like someone's coming from a top-down approach to say, you must teach this way. And so try never to frame it as that. I, you know, there's so many different ways to teach really effectively. And yeah. what I want to help people find is the way that works best for them. Right. Great. I love that individual approach. Yeah. So, well, we are speaking with Josh Eiler. The book is called How Humans Learn, um, and it's time for a song. So uh, let's see, what do I have for you today? Uh, the great bass player Avishi Cohen I've played quite a bit I've played sometimes here but I have a song here that I really like of his it's called One for Mark and you're listening to KSU Youth under 
Welcome back, everyone. So this is Lynn Vartan. This is the Apex Hour, KSU Youth under 91.1. Uh, that song was One for Mark uh, by Avishi Cohen. And just a reminder, if you're interested in the music that I play on the Apex Hour, there's a, a public playlist on on Spotify, but there's a link to it on our webpage, which is seu.edu slash Apex. Uh, and you can check out the playlist for all the songs that have been played on the Apex Hour. We are in the studio with Josh Eiler. Welcome back, Josh. Thank you, Lynn. Josh is the author of How Humans Learn, and today we are talking about teaching and learning. And um, I'd love to get into some of the concepts that are in your book. Sure. Um, there are sort of five main, you know, point, um, not so much points, but concepts mm-hmm. that you build up and around. And and one of them and that I know is a favorite for yours is emotion. Yes. Um, and it's, it's not in that chapter, but in the introduction, you say, hey, listen up, I need to tell you a story. It's something like on page two or something mm-hmm. like that. Uh, great little quote there. And um, in the emotion chapter, you talk about story storytelling and the importance of storytelling and as a teaching device. And I just would love to kind of talk about that a little bit and hear some more of your thoughts. Sure, definitely. Well, uh, yeah, storytelling, um, first of all, it's one of the absolute oldest teaching strategies. I mean, the the way people learned for a very long time was through the stories that, uh, that, that people in their community told them. And so this goes back a very, very long way. Um, but, you know, it's storytelling as a teaching strategy has the ability to tie in uh, our, our social natures as human beings, the emotional component, um, it, they're authentic. And so there's, there's lots of ways that storytelling, I think, really matters and helps in the classroom. Um, there's been some really interesting research to show that uh, people uh, be- develop more empathy through stories, uh, both telling and listening. Uh, what w- one of the things we know about our brains is that they will frequently try to fit information into a story, that placing bits of information into the context of a story helps us to remember more and helps us to draw that back out. So we, what we remember is the story, and then that ties to the information. And so it's true that in every discipline, there are ways that we can frame the material that we're teaching through uh, stories uh, that are somehow connected to that. Um, you know, one good example, a mentor of mine at Rice named Kathy Matthews, she's a biochemist beloved by students and, and colleagues alike. And she tells, uh, she teaches, you know, intro to biochemistry, that kind of thing. And she will typically tell the stories behind the discoveries that were made. And so when she teaches about, uh, you know, DNA and the Nobel for that, she'll talk about Watson and Crick and, and you know, all the mistakes they made along the way, mm-hmm. you know, some of the scandals that happen as a part of that. So she frames what could be, uh, in some cases, pretty dry genetic <laughs> right. background uh, through the lens of these really interesting stories about the people who made the discoveries and who contributed along the way. I think there are many examples that we can use for that mm-hmm. um, or, or that, that tie into that because our students really do respond well to stories. So when you're working on, uh, you know, a class of yours or helping a colleague, I mean, do you sort of look through the content and try to say, like, you know, talk through those? Like, how do you help someone make a class better mm-hmm. in that way or incorporate stories or uh, how, what's that process like? 
Right, sure. Well, it can look at a couple of different ways. Sometimes people will come and say, you know, I really want to try something new, and uh, we kind of talk through it that way and to think about, okay, well, this is a really interesting topic. What? Why did you select it? What's interesting to you about it? And mm-hmm. kind of uh, go from there. Because sometimes the stories can be about you as, and as the instructor and your kind of um, – yeah, the the stages you went through in the right. discipline and, right. and and that sort of thing, or it can be it can be uh, other kinds of stories as well. So sometimes it's that. Sometimes folks will ask me to come observe their class, and uh, there I get uh, I get kind of in real time uh, what's happening and how the material is being framed, and that can help us kind of brainstorm. Uh, the possible uses of storytelling that might uh, that might shift uh, the way the material is delivered mm. a little bit more. So it can come from a number of different angles. Cool. And one of the other uh, topics in the book is is failure. Mm-hmm. You know, and I'd love to get into a little bit about um, you know any any best practices and maybe a bit about the importance of it, but mm-hmm. best practices to incorporate more failure into your classroom, which of course sounds so counterintuitive Mm -hmm. at first, but we do need that. Yes, definitely. I think um, we could call it, we could call it error. We could call it mistake, failure. It's all, uh, it's all a piece of the same puzzle. Um, And what we know is that people learn best when they're given an opportunity to try something out, make a mistake and get feedback on that and begin the cycle all over again. Um, and that, so that's the importance of failure. Our brains are designed to detect uh, those errors when they're made and to draw resources to that. And so this is really how we're built. And so if we design educational experiences that somehow uh, arrest that cycle before it can play out, we we haven't uh, we haven't allowed students to uh, to really learn in a way that that, that they'll ultimately be successful. So uh, that's kind of the importance of it. How do we do it? Is a whole other <laughs> whole yeah. other volume because we're uh, you know our our educational systems are not set up in this way. Right? Yeah. We frequently just give students really high stakes tests, one chance. Uh, not a lot of room to learn from the feedback that we're giving them for that particular assignment. So <clears throat> here's some things that I've learned that I think uh, people are experimenting with and having really good success with. One is very simple, um, although it does require planning, uh, to um, to break down the course grade into smaller increments. And so rather than four exams, each worth 25% of the grade, somehow implement other small, low-stakes assignments that students can practice the skills that you need them to develop in a way where you're giving them feedback, but not necessarily grades. Or if you're giving them a grade, it's for a much smaller percentage, which has the effect of helping them learn from that assignment, but also take some of the pressure off of the those exams as well. Uh, because if, uh, you know, if if students are in a, circum- a situation where they know they're taking an exam that's worth 25% of their grade, there is no, absolutely no incentive for them to take an intellectual risk or try something out that they, they might not get right. Right, right. Um, so that's, that's a small thing. Uh, things that I love that people are trying, uh, uh, two things. One, group testing, where students will take an exam as an individual and then the next day or later in the period, they'll take it the same exam as a as a group and try to defend their answers and convince each other of who's right and and how to build oh, those cool. answers. And then the fact that I've seen a range of approaches. Some faculty average those two grades. Some weight them slightly differently. The point though is that it's drawing on a lot of what we know about how learning happens to really help students. Uh, succeed in that in that particular arena so that means for failure uh with connection to failure if you make a mistake as an individual a it doesn't count as heavily against you and b you actually get to learn from the group that you're with uh why you might have gotten it wrong right right um so that's one thing another thing that i really love that people are experimenting with uh multiple choice tests that they where the focus is not entirely on getting the correct answer. And so uh the the ones that I've seen, the models that I love and 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 hold up uh often 
are uh, they'll start with okay, what's the correct answer? But the next question is choose another answer and explain why it's wrong. Oh, I love that. Then they have another step that says now choose another answer and show what the question would have had to look like for that to be the right answer. Oh, and that's great. So there are different ways they play with it, but the the point is it's not all about getting it correct. Yeah. Oh、and、my gosh, those are real gems. Thank so, you. Yeah, the, those are people are really having. Good luck with those. Oh, that's great. Well, I'd love to move into so the social, the social aspect of it, or、sure. sociability, or sociality,、mm-hmm. um, and talk about some best practices.、Um, I know that you know discussion is one of the strongest、um, you know elements or, or pedagogical tools that we can use. But I'm always curious about it because I think, for me personally, as a student, not、mm-hmm. not so much as a t- teacher, but as a student, I am.、Um, I, I tended to like learning on my own and like figuring things out myself, and so I wonder. Sometimes I would have been the kind of student who wasn't as in favor of like discussion type things,、mm-hmm. but I was just curious because I I know discussion is so important. So maybe talk to us a little bit about that, a little bit about some other ways to increase that social connection in、right. learning. Sure. Well, the I mean, it is true that discussion based teaching、uh, has the ability. To be、uh, one of our most effective social pedagogies,、uh, but there are certain things that we need to do to make that happen.、Right. And so I sympathize with those students who、uh, are sometimes in discussion environments where they're thinking, you know,、um, this is great, but what am I learning? Right? You know, we're talking to each other, but am I learning anything? Right. And that's really the tricky part. Right. And so a couple of things、um, uh, we have to pay close attention to our goals. For the discussion, where do we want students to be at the end of the class session?、Oh. What what direction should they have been headed in? What kind of knowledge do we want、uh, them to have generated together? We have to be very transparent, very early in the semester about what the purpose of discussion is,、right. uh, and that's a step that I myself am guilty of skipping over. The seem,、uh, thinking, for example, that it's just intuitive why we're having discussion,、right. but the research suggests that. Uh, we need to be really transparent with students about why we feel discussion is the best strategy for helping them to learn. And then the third thing is、um, paying,、uh, being very intentional and paying close attention to the kinds of questions that we're asking.、Um, in other words, a lot of open-ended questions rather than closed-ended questions because they kind of shut down conversations.、Um, but also not being afraid to ask questions. And I will acknowledge this is harder, especially、uh, early in a teaching career. But not being afraid to an- ask questions that we don't know the answer to, right?、Um, because that lets everyone in on the project of okay, well, this is let's take a stab at it. Let's let's try and figure out an approach and bringing a lot of people's thoughts to bear on a particular topic.、Mm-hmm. Uh, When there might not just be one set answer, there may be several uh, uh, several ways of addressing a, p- a particular problem. Yeah, I think one of the things that I, <laughs> I I see a mistake made is is people discussions tend to just end up being well, what do you think about this,、right. and what do you think about this, and what do you think about this, and and it's a lot of unfounded. Uh, information,、right. but I think that those setting goals, you know, of what you want to happen and, and what you want them to have、mm-hmm. learned, you、right. know,、um, what are your objectives? I think will make a big difference in that. Exactly, and、um, so、uh, two things about that. One is you're absolutely right. There's a limit to how open. The questions can be and still have learning taking place. It's okay to sprinkle in every now and then. Of what? What do you think about that? But、uh, you know, this gets back to your earlier comment. Too many of them, and the class is really just a litany of people's opinions about things, right?、Uh, rather right. than learning. The other thing、uh, I think that's important is that、um, even if students haven't haven't yet developed the skills. To completely answer a major question in the discipline, that doesn't mean that they won't learn something in attempting to answer that question.、Mm-hmm. And so, as a part of discussion, we can we can throw out a big question. Right? Scholars disagree about this. Some think this, and some think this. What do you think,、mm-hmm. and how, and why would you approach it that way? And you know that it, because they don't have PhDs in our discipline, that they. they Probably、uh, won't get as far as you know a, a scholar might, but 
going through that process and attempting, there's a lot of learning that happens there. Right, right. So we need to have give them some freedom to to do that kind of work. That's not, that's great. Thank that's so helpful for that. I'd love to zero in a bit more on the transparency component, mm-hmm. and um, I, I I am a big fan of that. You know, I feel if you're if you're really being transparent of every step of the way of why why that gets to a bit of the authenticity Mm -hmm. uh, component in your book as well. You know, why are you doing this? What are the applications for it? That kind of thing. Um, What advice uh, or best practices or whatever can you think of for people who want to sort of um, check on their transparency? And because what happens, and I'm, I mean, I'm sure I'm guilty of it too. You, you get so in your, in your sort of process that Mm -hmm. you, take for granted, perhaps, that they understand why they're doing this particular thing. Right. It may seem obvious to you. So if somebody wants to sort of examine their transparency mm-hmm. or any best practices yeah. regarding transparency, I'd love to hear about those. Definitely. Well, I think one basic um, premise here is that it's hard to be too transparent, right? if you know what I mean. So uh, if you feel as if it, it would benefit students by talking about why you're doing something or why you've structured an exam in a certain way, designed these questions in a certain way, I even, and I know many also who do this, will bring in research about a particular teaching strategy and show students and say, here's why I'm doing this. And we'll even sometimes have a discussion about uh, about the, the data that I'm showing them. But uh, it's hard to be too transparent. So uh, right. I, one best practice I would say, you can always err on the side of being more transparent than less. Right. Okay. The, the other key, and I think this is a bigger one, and this connects to a lot of teaching dilemmas, getting frequent student feedback will help you in almost every aspect of teaching. In fact, I sometimes joked that if someone cornered me and said, what's the one thing I can do right away to be a more effective teacher? I always say, get student feedback as frequently as possible. With transparency in particular, it's possible to say, to give them a short uh, minute paper at the end of class or a muddiest point, some, some, sort of, uh, some sort of tool that asks them, do you know why we did what we did today? Do you know why we did it this way? And the answers will help you see whether or not you need to be more transparent. Now, in this case, when I say student feedback, I genuinely mean uh, feedback that we get that's meant to improve our teaching and their learning. Uh, I, I'm not talking here about the end of semester student that's evaluation. Great. I was just, right. you totally took the right. next question, right. of course, because that's where everybody goes, right? right? Because the end of this, this semester evaluations, I, I know we've struggled with them here, first finding the right uh, format, finding mm-hmm. the right thing. And then that, the way students interact on those and the the, the questions, even the with the best intentions and trying to formulate the questions the best possible way, right. the feedback is not what I think what you're talking about, which sounds much, much better. Right. No, this is, uh, you know, some people I know will get that feedback every day. Some people once a week, some people once, you know, at midterms, right? But the key is uh, that is our best tool in seeing if the, in creative writing, they talk about the, a lot, does the intent marry the effect? Yeah. Does our intent lead to the effect that we're hoping it will. And um, that that feedback really uh, helps with that. Yeah. So some of those questions like, do you, did you understand why we were doing this particular activity or mm-hmm. why it was presented in this way or why this exam was that those, I mean, I hadn't really thought of doing mm-hmm. those kinds of assignments or getting that kind of feedback. Yeah, and that's particular to the transparency issue. Most uh, most folks use a version of a minute paper, which was a tool developed a long time ago, and it really just has three questions on it. Uh, What worked well, what didn't, and, you know, what should I, what what could we do more of, that sort of thing. Um, Or they'll use something that that, um, folks call a muddiest point, which is really students just write down what are they still confused about? That's great. And then you get, that's, that you come in the next day and say, okay, it seems like um, I, I could have been clear about 
X topic and talk about it for a few minutes, and then you can go on to the work of the, the that day's class. That's so cool. Thank you. All right, it's time for some more music. Uh, so this is a, a, a an artist called Natalie Joachim, uh, J O A C H I M, um, and this is a prelude. It's Sweet Pour Danton, and uh, you're listening to KSUU Thunder ninety one point one. Hey, well, welcome back. I do want to tell you a little bit more of that song. This is Lynn Vartan. You're listening to KSUU Thunder 91.1. This is the Apex Hour. Uh, that song, that was the first movement of, of a suite. Uh, so it was the prelude of, of Sweet Pou Danton. Um, the artist was Natalie Joachim, but also I wanted to mention that the spectral quartet, string quartet, spectral being S-P-E-K-T-R-A-L, spectral quartet is also on that um, album and on that track. And it's a really interesting sound, um, as you probably heard. So anyway, back to talking about <laughs> teaching and learning. Welcome back, Josh Eiler. Thank you. The book is called How Humans Learn. Um, and I just so enjoyed it. And you can definitely get it anywhere where you get your books, uh, either in uh, e-version or paperback or whatnot. Um, so I would love to start, we've been talking about all the great you know, some of the great tactics, best mm -hmm. practices yes. um, on some of the things that we could do. And, and, you know, of course, in our education system, there are some things that have gotten in the way of some of those things we've talked about, you know, the, the high stakes grading and how that's affected our students. 
I'd love to know a little bit, like if you had your dream education system, mm -hmm. if you were going to rebuild things from the ground up um, in America, what what would that look like? Like what kinds yeah. of things would you, let's say there was no, you didn't have to talk to anybody. You just could build it on your own, you mm -hmm. know, um, as it will. What, what's some, what are some of the things that you would really love to see in there? Oh, to have that power. That, I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> this is one of my favorite questions I've ever been asked. I like it. All um, right. So uh, the first thing that I want to say is that in my dream world, states give as much funding to schools as they need and we pay teachers like the professionals that they are so yes amen that, brother <laughs> that, uh, that i think would make a lot of these other things possible but yeah. um okay so then in elementary school uh i think that one thing that I, the that teachers I talked to are pretty clear on and the research is also clear on. And the fact that there's agreement there, I think is really telling. And that would be that we should focus, especially in the earlier grades, much more on helping children develop self-confidence, self-efficacy, helping them find what they really are interested in and fascinated by, and a lot of play, like two or three recesses a day, yeah. not just one. Um, there's so much work out there that shows the connections between giving little kids the uh, the freedom to play, and that frees up some time then uh, for learning as well. So the, the younger grades need to be developing the, the kinds of uh, personal skills that will let them be successful once they get to the age where, you know, developing content knowledge and skills becomes more important. So I think that's really important. You could head a lot of math anxiety and test anxiety off at the pass if you spent more time at those ages helping them cultivate confidence. Do you think that's always been a need or is that something that's more of a need now than ever, perhaps because things are different at the home and you know, people hmm. are so spread with all their responsibility. Is it more now, less now, or is it just always been a need and always should be there in the classroom? Yeah, I think it's always been a need. Um, I think uh, people haven't changed very much. I think that they're. The, I think that our educational systems have changed, and the the amount of time focused on content and test prep and all those things has increased. Right, right, and right. And so in that, in that way, there might be a little bit more need now than there used to be. But in general, these are things that, that children need overall. Right. Um, so at elementary school, I think that would be really appropriate. Middle school, I think we also need to help students. Uh, at, at content becomes really important, but so does also uh, the arts and physical education, really making sure that uh, s that children understand that the world is more than just uh, than just um, content knowledge. That there's a lot more to it. At those ages, middle school, it's also really important. And I know some schools are moving in this direction, helping those students develop social emotional intelligence. Yeah, uh, helping them to understand. Uh, a lot of what makes the world work, right? And and really thinking about the social dynamics uh, of of um, of the world and 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 everything that comes into play with well, moving beyond. And same question with that. I I agree a hundred percent. Is that is that need something that you see more now? Uh, uh, or is the world so is is the pace so accelerated that students maybe need that social knowledge earlier? Is it is it different than it was in the past? Do you think? I think I don't know about at the middle school age. Mm -hmm. uh, I maybe more in high school, but yeah. um, I do think uh, here uh, here are two things. One thing is that especially as they get older, um, social media becomes more plays more of a role in their lives. Right. What we know from research on social media is that the images that people put forward on social media are carefully curated. Yes. Uh, and so uh, as adults, it's easy to see that. Yes. Right? Uh, but, Sometimes, not right, all the time. Right. Even we have trouble with <laughs> well, that. that. No, that's true. It's easier. Let yeah. me put it that way. Uh, when you're 16, yeah. you may not know that the perfect images that you're seeing right. are just 
are curated, are very carefully selected. And we see a lot of work now showing that, you know, teenagers are judging themselves against images that, uh, that, that may not entirely be true, right? And, yeah, and so, yeah. um, so social emotional intelligence and the ability to kind of work through a world dominated by social media, I think. That's so cool. What would a class like that be like? I, I wonder. I, you know, I don't know. I think that, um, we, if we made more space over the course of a school day, yeah. uh, it would be possible yeah, to, yeah, yeah. To, to do that. Also possible to, I think, build it into cur- yeah. curricula. Too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I teach English, and so I, th- I can think of lots of ways that you could talk about the relevance of particular um, thing that you're reading about a piece of literature to their lives. Absolutely, um, yeah. So I, I, I think that's a key. I also think you, at middle in middle school and high school, uh, parents... Um, we don't get off scot free, right? Yeah. <laughs> and there has been certainly a trend over the the last few decades to try and involve our children in as many different activities as possible. So we are culpable for increasing how frenetic yes. their lives have been. Yes, um, right. And so, you know, looking really carefully at that as well. Um, well, and as a parent yourself, yes. I mean, that's a, it's such a tricky, right? I mean, how do you balance that? Sure. You want the best for them and, and you, you want to, you want to help them find what they what they really enjoy, right? Yeah. Um, and I think that there's also, uh, with some a, a kind of a pressing need, an invisible need that's out there that if we don't do enough right now, are we preparing them for right. what's to come? Right, um, right. And so, you know, there's a give and take with that, and it has to be a, a it's a fine balance. Right. Out college, I think. Yeah, um, let's hear it. <laughs> Uh, I think lots of things. I think that there uh, that we should invest more time in helping students, especially early on, discover what they really are passionate about. What uh, before they pick a major, let's help them decide what do I want my life to be like, yeah. what, and and how does my career fit into the life that I want to lead? Right. And so how can I marry those together in a college curriculum? And the reason I say that is because. Students at that point have spent so much time in their lives preparing to get into college. There hasn't been a lot of attention paid to, well, what do I do now that I'm here? Right, right. right. Some go to college uh, absolutely knowing what they might want to do, but many do not. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so I think helping students see how it's yet another stage on uh, leading a meaningful life, I think, is important. Yeah. Another thing then... uh, Putting much less emphasis on grades and, yes. and much more attention on on feedback and and helping those students develop the skills that they will need um, to, to uh, pursue whatever career they want to pursue. Uh, and finally, I think you know a lot of uh, there are some colleges who are having really great luck with interdisciplinary studies or. Um, self-crafted majors. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity there to explore. You yeah. know, certainly there needs to be guidance for of those course, efforts. Yeah. But it, let's say a student wants to be uh, an, anim- an animal behaviorist, right? Uh, in a, a traditional college, uh, that would probably look like uh, a student having to double major in biology and psychology, right, something like right, that. Right, right, right. But there's a whole other possibility where we could, with guidance, help a student craft a major that would that would benefit him or her more than the double major might. Right, right, right. Um, so that's my. That's kind of my pie in the sky view of what education could be. I love it. That's it. The world according to Josh Eiler. <laughs> right. Perfect. Well, no, that's it's really cool to hear because yeah, I mean, we can spend a lot of time deciding what we're not doing right and all that and right. but it's kind of fun to dream a bit and say like, well, what what does it look like, you know, and that's right. sort of hopeful in a way somehow. So I agree, definitely. Well, we have one last song to play and then we'll come back for our favorite last question. But okay. this last song that I have is um, called River Rises. Uh, the group is called The Gadabouts and it's a whole bunch of people. It's Edie Perkel, um, the singer, Steve Gadd, the amazing drummer, Andy Fairweather. So the, there's Andy Fairweather Low. There's just a whole bunch of different people on this song. It's kind of a big collaboration. Check it out. <laughs> You got me all right If you think just because I love you That 
to get us back in here so because we just have a few minutes to that's a good place to stop right there that song was uh river rises uh, by the gadabouts this really cool collection of a ton of uh great musicians just getting together to play an album so anyway i'm back in the studio with josh eiler for our last little break break welcome back josh Thank you. So I have a question that I love to ask every guest, and I'm going to ask it to you. It's The question is, like, what's turning you on this weekend? It can be anything. It could be a, an album. It could be a TV show. It could be a movie. It could be a book. It could be some crazy food item. It could be anything, but just an opportunity for our audience to kind of get a little more insight to you. So Josh Eiler, what's turning you on this week? Well, it is the final season of Schitt's Creek. Oh, yes. <laughs> best, the best. Yes, and my wife and I love that show. And so we're, uh, we've are we been watching the, the episodes of the final season. So not only is it hilarious, which is, you know, it's just a great way to end the day, but 
I just love the premise of the show that, you know, Daniel Levy has talked about. Imagine a world where you have all these quirky characters, but everyone's free to be themselves and love whoever they want to love. And I just think that that's an amazing uh, message that uh, that we need to have more of. A hundred percent agreed. Thank you. What a great one. Well, that's the end of our show for today. So we'll leave you with that wonderful thought. Thank you, Josh, so much for your time. Thank you for the invitation. And thank you all for listening. See ya. Thanks so much for listening to the Apex Hour here on KSUU Thunder 91.1. Come find us again next Thursday at 3 p.m. for more conversations with the visiting guests at Southern Utah University and new music to discover for your next playlist. And in the meantime, we would love to see you at our events on campus. To find out more, check out suu.edu slash apex. Until next week, this is Lynn Vartan saying goodbye from the Apex Hour here on Thunder 91.1.